Hello and welcome you're watching One India News this is our weekly show global chit chat where we discuss the recent developments in geopolitics in the recent weeks with our guest and expert Mr Tridevesh Singh Maini hello sir welcome back to our show good afternoon good afternoon uh, so sir let's uh, dive right into it uh, so washington uh, is becoming increasingly worried about uh, turkey and russian ties right because russia is depending on turkey for you know promoting its business despite all the sanctions that are being put on by the western countries so uh, the us has uh, warned turkey uh, that you know if they continue to promote their ties with russia they are going to put sanctions on the country so what do you think is going to happen in this regard what do you think is going to be the future developments in this regard so uh, i think it's an important step because <clears throat> we need to look at turkey's role ever since you know the uh, in the aftermath of the ukraine crisis in the aftermath mm -hmm. of the russia ukraine war whatever you want to call it so what has happened is that turkey has been uh, sort of enjoying its role as you know being a balancer and has also uh, fancied itself and has been actually uh, to an extent a sort of uh, intermediary between the west and uh, russia right and this has to do with its uh, membership of nato the fact that you know its own geographical location right at, at the sort of cusp of the middle east and europe you know you know all that now this is uh, significant because it's not just turkey but as you would be knowing even india has been doing a balancing act between russia mm -hmm. and the us in fact in terms of whether it's buying oil whether it's looking at other economic op opportunities even connect even india is mm -hmm. doing the same so the state department uh, has given two statements with regard to india the us state department one yesterday again it reiterated the stand that you know it has It, it values its ties with India and understands its compulsions as far as ties with Russia are concerned. Now, Turkey, uh, I don't think that the U.S. would have an objection of Turkey having economic linkages to a point because Turkey was also trying has all. I mean, recently they also uh, when uh, uh, the uh, when Erdogan and Putin had met, they had also spoken mm -hmm. about you know ensuring that how the supply chains can be revived, you know, especially. Mm -hmm. and that was one part and they in fact recently uh, we have been seeing a number of uh, you know ships also being allowed actually to the uh, to odessa in ukraine and mm -hmm. so that uh, whatever uh, food supplies whatever uh, wheat etc have to be exported by ukraine you know that whole process can begin so this was so but the problem is that one it is not just uh, direct economic linkages or anything to do with the uh, you know dire needs basically turkey is being used to circumvent the, uh, the, the you know sanctions which were imposed by the us on russia so russia is using it as like for instance you know like you can draw a parallel with how iran was using mm -hmm. the ua right for selling right. oil to china mm -hmm. so turkey has that one is that part then obviously its purchase of oil has increased like like other countries it has wanted to benefit from cheap russian oil you know that that is mm -hmm. there and its own mm -hmm. exports to russia have also increased so i think it's a part about uh, so the us uh, treasury secretary had visited turkey in june and uh, mm -hmm. recently also he had issued letters actually to uh, business mm -hmm. associations in turkey that you know that obviously so there is an understanding of the fact that you can have economic relations to a point but don't uh, misuse or take advantage right. of the us is giving some space which it has been giving i mean in all fairness it has had to show more flexibility on a number of issues even as we know iran has also been selling much more oil you know even though the jcpo has right. not been reached, so we know all that so i think it's it's about uh, it doesn't want that because you see you have to strike a balance you have to understand the compulsions of others but you also don't want uh, a message to go out that these sanctions are irrelevant and obviously right. have, uh, i mean if russia sees for instance the turkey can be used tomorrow right. other countries will also be using now okay. if it right. does not go through the jcpo iran nuclear deal then obviously iran, you know iran and turkey will also find so the how sort of trilateral emerging in that sense but i really don't think it's going to impact uh, the bilateral relationship as such and the us is not also going to take a drastic stance but it shows a, right. you know the the uh, limits to which you can balance relationships 
and it also shows the limits to which the us can give space to other countries and i it would be interesting to see that to what extent i mean um, does the us allow other countries also to have uh, substantial ties with uh, russia that's something to right Right, right. And speaking about amicable bilateral ties, uh, Germany and Canada, they have signed a cooperation agreement for the production and transport of hydrogen uh, on the second day of German Chancellor's uh, inaugural trip to Canada, right? So, what can you elaborate about this development, this entire development? How, how it will impact uh, globally? How will it have a global impact? How is it going to impact in the other countries or uh, the entire setup? So, uh this this uh, agreement was signed during the uh, visit of the german premier to canada mm -hmm. recently mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. two things one is obviously there is a strong economic component to it basically uh, both countries are looking to build a corridor mm -hmm. and, and also to ex basically uh, canada will be exporting uh, mm -hmm. uh, hydrogen to uh, germany so that's the, the corridor part of it is ob obviously is an economic sense too. And for very long, people are saying that, that Germany should reduce uh, its dependence, you know, on Russia mm -hmm. and it needs to look at other sources, right, for energy right. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, but and obviously, but this is not going to happen in the short run. This, this, this is uh, the target is 2025, but it's just about uh, signaling and some other agreements are also signed, for instance, uh, I think Mercedes had signed uh, an agreement with some uh, Canadian uh, uh, government department with regard to electric vehicles. But apart from the economic aspect, uh, mm -hmm. both sides also said that this is this agreement is important because you cannot forever, you know, they hinted basically to the fact that you mm -hmm. need to reduce your dependence upon Russia, you need to look at other sources. That is, right. that part was also mentioned. So that is, a, but from an economic sense, as I said, it's, it's very tough that in the short run, there are going to be any benefits as such. Mm -hmm. But obviously, mm -hmm. probably Germany has learned its lessons from the past mm -hmm. that, you know, you basically have a long-term strategy at this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, if there's any crisis or any, if you look at the global supply chains, if there's a massive disturbance and you're dependent only upon one country, uh, mm -hmm. you're in for problems. So in that sense, it's an important step. And also the fact that uh, uh, this whole alliance, this, uh, uh, you know, anti-Russia alliance, uh, which mm -hmm. is built up for uh, obviously the US is at the forefront, but in recent mm -hmm. years, uh, Canada has, for instance, been part of not anti Russia per se, anti China alliance. So, but even in this, right. if you look at, I mean, some of the statements from Trudeau, they were clear that you know, Canada, mm -hmm. Canada, Germany, and all they also want to play an important role. Not, I mean, not necessarily anti, but they are wary of, uh, you know, being seen as kowtowing in any way. Mm -hmm. Russia because of their economic constraints or whatever. Right, right. And uh, speaking about Canada, uh, there's a delay in the processing of uh, Indian visas and student permits for some Indian students. And now uh, the, there are reports that the Indian High Commission in Ottawa has asked the Canadian government to look into the problems. And there are students who are suffering for this. So do you think, why do you think firstly this uh, problem has erupted and do you think that this is going to impact Canada-India relation? So I'd like to just take up a couple of points again, that first of all, in recent times, there has been this talk about the rejection of more student visas, you know, from mm -hmm. India, there was a news a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so there was an argument that this is basically to reduce, you know, the number, basically, if you look at the demography, obviously, there are mm -hmm. changes taking place and more students from India and as a result of more international students and professionals, then they get residency, then they settle down there. Then if you see, if mm -hmm. you actually look at the list of languages, for instance, you have a number of Indian languages, Punjabis are number four, then you have uh, Malayalam also, you have other uh, Indian languages, right? Malayalam is at probably 11 and then Hindi is mm -hmm. also high. So, I mean, I'm not saying that this is, that this is necessarily the reason, but this is something you have to recognize that there is a shift taking place. Uh, and mm. uh, there must there are some quarters in Canada which are skeptical about this. Now this is not necessarily linked to uh, the rejection of the student visas. But what I'm trying to say is that obviously we see a liberal face of Canada. But like any other country, there are there are some concerns, especially amongst the conservatives and even others about. And mm. then obviously once the demography changes slowly but surely, other mm. changes take place. 
so that is one part which you need to understand not necessarily for this delay but otherwise for you know uh, immigrants or international students going to canada the second part is that there has been a delay this year because first of all you know uh, the orientation and all starts in the second week of september basically when like in, in western mm -hmm. universities uh, us starts a bit early the us term starts probably earlier but uk and canada for instance generally it's around you know this time of september now there has been a delay in the board exam results this year that is one thing mm -hmm. has impacted okay. how students applied for uh, the canadian obviously that delayed the application process uh, so that is the first thing the second thing is that what is happening is that there is a rise in the number of student visa applications as a result the processing time is taking longer so when actually this issue was raised with the the canadians about whether this has anything to do with the first point that you discussed about you know the right. industry so they have flatly denied it and they have said that obviously uh, there are mm -hmm. other reasons every application is looked at at merit and more importantly uh, because there are more student applications the processing time has increased from 4 weeks to up to 12 weeks now that is very important now once you have that then naturally then most students are not it's it's touch and go uh, for this mm -hmm. uh fall semester so most of them have then deferred their admissions to the spring semester but i would just like to add one thing at the end of it that you know mm -hmm. uh this increasing uh sort of when number of applications and increasing number of focus so first whether it's uk us canada australia it also brings us to a point that maybe indian students need to look at other countries as well Right, right. But there are more opportunities in Canada, don't you think? Because the government already, I think, wants to induct more students, especially Indian ones, because of their population crisis over there. They wanted people to come in from India, especially, right? So, uh, so I'm just, I mean, in a very gen from a very uh, general perspective, not any specific mm -hmm. country I'm talking about, any of the Western mm -hmm. countries. Uh, we must also see that as uh, there are a number of Indian students who are actually, you know, let's say, entrepreneurs or. who are mm -hmm. willing to come back or who are willing to have to let's say who don't necessarily want to get out of india but it's more because of lack of opportunities so i think uh, as we had flagged earlier also and maybe mm -hmm. we'll be discussing in later weeks because sometime i think a country like uae would be very interesting you know especially with the fact mm -hmm. that uh, the uh, they're trying to encourage international students you have a long term visa which you've discussed uh, they are aware now of the fact that one of the reasons why people don't come is are insecure about their residency mm. status uh, mm. quality of life overall geographical location not just in terms of india but even access to the west so mm. and in fact a lot of uh, professionals who are, have shifted also from the west to you after getting residency or citizenship or whatever in fact there is another way also a lot of people what uh, people are doing is that if they want to just move out That they'll move out, let's say, to the UAE, and they'll apply for residency elsewhere. They may not live there mm -hmm. the rest, but they'll. Right. Have, that is the issue. But I think we, I mean, mm -hmm. because if uh, in terms of financial assistance you're getting, uh, and mm -hmm. and also the job opportunities and the quality of the jobs, you know, and the fact that you know everything else aside, the, the sort of whatever it is, it's a new sort of innovation hub. It's a dynamic economy. so for anybody who wants to do really well have access everywhere i think that ua is just one example the countries even in southeast asia in the future you could have a situation where vietnam also wants talented professionals but that's what, what i'm saying is the approach towards going abroad also needs to witness some sort of you know shift some change and there should be some dynamism and also i think right. just one final point that Uh, it's also important for because now you have social like now you know twitter facebook you have all access also you know what is going on i think students should also uh, see the trends themselves or and not mm. necessarily uh, go only by hearsay or by what you know people who are into the uh, industry of uh, <laughs> you know who have been mm. there for very long because obviously mm -hmm. everybody has their own baggage So if you think out right. of the box, you see the latest trend. You see visa policies. You see economic opportunities. Your choices should be driven by that. And there'll be many other opportunities. I mean, UAE is just one. I mean, in, in for instance, mm. in recent years, you've had Indian students are going to Taiwan also. Mm. Soon, okay. could, I mean, South. You know, even South Korea has also advanced. It's spoken about opening up, attracting Indian students. 
So uh, mm. opportunities, job opportunities, yes, maybe it's tougher, but they start coming. Mm. I mean, once you have a larger international student community to retain professionals. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So look into newer opportunities rather than you know base your own opinion on others' experiences. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for all the information that you have given us today, especially the last one. I hope that it helps the students that have watched the show today. And thank you everyone for watching Global Chit Chat. Catch us again on next week. Thank you so much.